everyone. Welcome to the only source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system on the web. This is the SoxProspects.com podcast. We're on episode number 124. Thank you for listening. My name is Chris Hatfield. I am the executive editor of SoxProspects.com. Coming to you today from the Sox Prospects Mid-Atlantic offices here in our nation's capital. Ian Cundell is joining me today from an undisclosed location where the streets have no name in God's country. Ian, you weren't here last week, but I was able to show that the podcast will go on with or without you. It's good to have you back, though. What are you up to today? I see what you did there. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, we're recording uh, early on a Sunday morning because I have uh, a little concert to attend later tonight. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, walking on to a concert later. Oh, so very well. well, well see, I, see, I went with, see, I went with all the Joshua Tree references. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a beautiful day today, so. That we'll also not a Joshua Tree reference. I know. Just but I'll going. allow it. I'll allow it. Yeah. Uh, no, it's funny how, like, so pe- people may or may not realize this. Like, Ian and I don't, like, see each other regularly or anything. Like, this is us hanging out, frankly. I, I think it would probably be the, uh, one way to describe it. This is how I we mean, hang out. That's generally what happens when one person lives in the District of Ex- Columbia and, and another our, one lives yes. in Boston. Exactly. But, <laughs> like, when I see you at Instructs and stuff, or not Instructs, but, like, spring training and things like that, like, we, we remember things. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. We both, like, you too, and like yes, things like that. Very like, much so. so. Yeah, yeah. So it should be a good day. So you've se- you've seen you've seen them before, right? Uh, yeah, this will be my fifth time, I think, nice. maybe sixth. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I told I told my wife yesterday, like, oh, I have, we have to record early because Ian's going to see you too. And she's like, oh, you. She's like, are you jealous? I said yes. She's like, but you've seen them before. <laughs> I was like, yes. Your so. point. <laughs> <laughs> You're not helping. Yeah. yeah, I think they're here on Tuesday or something. Are they? I don't know. Yeah, I may, probably. I may not try and go. Anyway, all right, well, we've got a lot to talk about, Ian. Um, we've got some promotions. We've got, uh, you've got reports from Lowell and uh, maybe a couple from Pawtucket since you were last on. Uh, we've got some other things to talk about, uh, some transactions, draft signings. But uh, first, some housekeeping. One way that you guys can support the podcast is, sub- is to subscribe and leave us a positive rating and review. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're on Google Play Music. We're on YouTube. Subscribe so you know when a new episode is up and give us a four or five star rating and a nice review. That'll help us get in some new ears. Uh, another way you can support us is on Patreon at patreon.com slash socks prospects. Um, as I said last week, guys, the support on Patreon has been great so far. You go on there, you, you donate a small amount per episode, $1, $2, $5, whatever you feel comfortable with, and you get rewards based on your per episode contribution. Uh, as we do each show, we want to thank our $5 contributors. That would be Co- Cody Pimentel. Sock Signatures, Lendell Martin, Kirby Miller, Gerardo Ian Tosca, Kyle Costigan, Tyler Woodrall, and Jeff Trainer. Thank you to all those guys, and thank you to all of our contributors. Thank you to the Ludlow Thieves for our intro music. The song is called All the Money. Go check out their stuff on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, and however you listen to music. Uh, we love getting your emails. Send those to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We've only got one today because we didn't really advertise because we didn't really know until the last minute we were going to hop on here and do this, but... Uh, send us your emails. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. Uh, follow the site's Twitter, uh, at Sox Prospects. Uh, SoxProspects.com is the website. News.SoxProspects.com is the news page. Uh, join our forum. A lot of good conversation going on there. It's forum.SoxProspects.com. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, at SP Chris Hatfield. Follow Ian, at Ian Cundall. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. Um, I think that's everything, Ian. Got through that nice and quick so we can jump into this. Um, do you want to start with promotions? Sure. Everybody loves promotions. Everybody they loves do. them. They do. Especially when they get one that they've been clamoring for for about a month and a half. And uh, break it. And we did break it. That's true. We did We did break it. Um, that would be the promotion of Michael Chavis to Portland following the Carolina League All-Star game where he won the game's All-Star MVP award for driving in the game's only two runs on a double. In the first inning, game, of course, was also held in Salem, so nice for the hometown boy to take home the MVP award. Chavis had one hell of a first half, Ian. In 59 games, hit 318, 388, 641 with 17 home runs. He set a record at Salem's home park by hitting 12 home runs in a single season, and of course he did that in half a season. 
certainly raised his prospect stock. I think I can go ahead and say, you may or may not agree with this, but based on two of the three votes being in, it looks like Chavis is a leader in the clubhouse to be the number four prospect in the system on July 1st. Uh, what do you make of Chavis' half season, the promotion to Portland, and the thing that people probably most want to hear about, Ian, is the fact that Raphael Devers was not also promoted Everyone kind of assumed, including me, that this would be a chain promotion of Devers going up to Pawtucket and Chavis going up to Portland. As you mentioned on Twitter, as has been reported, is actually the thinking with the Red Sox. Uh, Part of the reason Devers, if not all of the reason, I would almost think, that Devers wasn't promoted to Pawtucket is that the Red Sox have signed Johnny Peralta to a minor league deal after he was uh, released by the St. Louis Cardinals. And Peralta is going to be the primary third baseman in Pawtucket for at least a short amount of time. So they're keeping Devers in Portland for now. So let's start with Chavis, and then we'll, we'll move on to the Devers talk, the related Devers talk. Chavis's first half, how far back onto the map does it put him for you? To me, I think it puts him ahead of where he ever was, frankly, even though he was a former first-round pick, for reasons that we'll get into when we talk about the draft signings and, and maybe what you saw in Lowell. But where do you hold Chavis right now? What questions do you have? What do you think he's showing? What do you think he still needs to show? Yeah, uh, I think he's, I would probably have him at four. I haven't done my list yet, but I think I'm leaning that way. Mm -hmm. And for me, it goes back to, I've decided, I've pretty much come to the conclusion that I'm just going to write off last year to the fact that he was injured. And And if you play through a hand injury, generally bad things happen. Yeah. So I'm willing to like overlook that. But so that means going back to 2015. I saw him in 2015, and there were, I had some concerns. I, I thought the power was real. I think you were there actually too in 2015 when we saw Greenville. Yes, he had the best. He had the most impressive batting practice on a team that included Yohan Moncada and Rafael and, Devers yeah, and a like few his, other guys. His BP is insane when he's healthy. But back then, the issues were defense and swing and miss slash approach. And it looks like he's gone away. I mean, I haven't seen him yet. Um, I'm going to hopefully be seeing Portland at some point in the next couple weeks. And it seems like, I mean, he's cut down his strikeout rate. Back in 2015, Greenville, it was over 30%. This year, it's down at 22%, which is perfectly fine, very manageable. And the Um, other thing when we saw him, not to interrupt, but the thing, too, I remember hearing is that he hit a few home runs early in the year. And he was just selling out for power. He was just selling out for power. I remember we saw him, and... His last at bat of one of the games we were at, he shortened up with two strikes, and it was his only hit of the game. And it's like, where has that been all game? Um, and it, it looked like the the short porch and left at Floor Field was kind of, and it's not even that short of a porch, frankly. No, but. it's just it's it's it, for those who haven't been to Floor Field, it's similar to like what they have in Portland or in Boston. With it's just a big main monster or green many, monster, many monster. Field. Yeah. yeah. And so, so. he was kind of selling out, and it looks. And I remember he had a couple home runs early this season, and. I was like, all right, the test is going to be if he starts selling out for power again and striking out, and he hasn't done that. So no, and he actually, if, if we should mention that he homered in his first double-A at bat, of course. First pitch like, of his first yeah, double-A first pitch, at bat. Yeah, first pitch, yeah. But I think, you know, there's still, the questions still remain, though. I, I want to see how the bat, uh, contact-wise, handles more advanced pitching. Because mm-hmm. when you get to double-A's, when you start seeing, we've, we've talked about it before, but you start seeing those junk ball like, or organizational arms that just know how to spin a breaking ball, locate a changeup, and sit like, 89 to 91 and those are the kind of guys that in the past he's had some trouble with uh just spin just you know breaking balls down the zone getting out ahead of it so i want to see how he handles against off-speed pitches because once the book is out on him you know that's when it's it's kind of a cat and mouse game you know mm-hmm. the new hitter shows up pitcher hasn't seen him so maybe he'll get a couple he'll have to get off to a solid start then the league will make adjustments to him then it's on him to make adjustments back to adjust to the adjustments of the pitchers and so on, and it's a never-ending game. But the bigger concern for me is, and it always has been, is going to be his defense. Um, yep. I think I read that he's only playing two games a week at third base. Yeah, which is apparently the they're going to they're going to play Devers at third five times a week and Chavis twice a week. I think the reasoning would probably be that they want to keep Devers fresh at third and, because he is an option for the major leagues this year, whereas Chavis is most certainly not. Oh, yeah, no, I agree, but at the same time, it's like game reps are what he needs. That's obviously not an ideal mm-hmm. situation, but I think sure. the bat kind of just forced it. Like, there was no point in having him go back and face the Carolina League pitching for mm-hmm. a second for the second half, especially considering how small the league is. You know, he's going to be seeing exact same guys over and over again. Although so it, is, it is two teams larger this year. Yeah, so it's, it's, not, not it's up bad. to 10, but still, still. It's like you're seeing the same guys again and again, so it's, there's no point. 
But, um, I mean, it's exciting that he's kind of raised his level because as we talked about and kind of pulled ahead of the pack, I think, in that next year. Because in the past, I mean, the, as we've talked about the system, it's not very good right now. And they needed someone to step forward and kind of take that step to maybe be a project project as a regular type player in the future. And I'm, I'd like to see him before I'm willing to go there and, you know, mm-hmm. say that more definitively. But it's a good, you know, it's it's definitely a good sign for yeah. the system that that's, he's that's, really going to step forward. I was just about to say that when you started to go there is that I need to see more from him before I can. Right no, now we so. have him projected as a as a role 4.5 player, which if you if you go onto the about page at Sox Prospects, it's SoxProspects.com slash about dot htm. There's a link at the top. Um, it includes our scouting scale and a 4.5 grade 4.5 is a bench slash utility player. So the example we give is Darnell McDonald, whereas a five is an average regular. The example we give is Jed Lowry. Um, you know, a six is an impact everyday player. The example we give is Jacoby Ellsbury. And it should, it should be known that's not like our rating scale, but no, the, comps are, the comps are biased. But the rating scale is from ML is basically is what MLB's scouts. Well, it's the accepted, yeah, it's the yeah. it's what they it's what they teach at the scout school. Yeah, um, that's so. a uniform. We scale. didn't make that up. Uh, so. I want to see what he does in Portland uh, before yes. I'm willing to move him to being a role five player. I think he's clearly the best role four point five player or forty five. I guess would be. Probably I mean, he, the has, he way has to put he it. has the upside because if he can stick a third base and he hits, I mean, he's like a twenty five, twenty to twenty five home run guy who maybe hits like two seventy mm-hmm. with average defense. I mean, and that's like that's like a regular borderline first division. Plus, probably like a fifty five player, yeah. like. Similar, I'm trying to think of someone in the MLB, kind of like like a little little light Jake Lamb, something like that. Because mm-hmm. I think Jake Lamb has a little more power and is obviously a better defender, but yeah. in, kind of in that mold. Yeah, I mean, I think it, were, it it merits mentioning too, though. I know on our forum we have a couple few people kind of going nuts with Shavis. Uh, I mean, some things to keep in mind. Yes, he had a wonderful first half, showing the kind of power that we don't see a lot in this system, especially in the Carolina League, where home runs go to die. Um, I think he was one short of hitting the, a number of home runs. That, or I guess, let me put it this way. At home last year, the Salem Red Sox hit 18 home runs, and he hit 12 at home in the first half. So that says something. But that said, keep in mind, the reason he's not turning himself into a you know, top 50 prospect in the game or anything, keep in mind, Rafael Devers is almost a full year younger and has been playing the whole season at an entire level higher. That's significant. That's yeah. very significant. I mean, that's, in, that's why Devers is a top twenty prospect in the game, if not a top ten prospect. Frankly, and Devers you know, that's just a has better tools, though, too. Well, yeah, I mean, it's better tools. But I'm saying, even if you just wanted to look at the production, Devers' yeah. production is not that far behind Chavis's. And yeah, okay, in his first game, he had a home run. That's great. I love it. I hope we see more of that. But he still has a long way to go before he even shows me he's on Sam Travis's level. Frankly, yeah. Yep. So, yeah, but good to see out of Shava so far. We should probably address the, the timeshare thing, Ian. A lot of people well, freaking out. Oh, no, I was just, I thought, no, I thought you were going to go. So keep going. I, I have something else to add on the okay. promotion. Well, but, the, the, yeah. we'll mention Chad De La Guerra in a that's, second. A, that's what I was yeah. going to say. Okay, we'll, yeah. we'll get there in a second. But okay. um, actually, let's just get that out of the way because there's really not a whole lot to say. Chad De La Guerra was also promoted after the All-Star game. He started for... Um, in the all-star game as well at second base has played a lot of shortstop this year. Have you gotten any reports on that? Cause it's surprising. Cause he was not good at second. when I saw him in Lowell. So. And he's, he's, he, even when Zue Lynn and he were on the same team in Portland for all of a game, Lynn was playing center and De La Guerra was at short, which I found interesting. Um, so it looks like he's going to be I mean, primary if, if shortstop. He can, while if he Lynn's can play up. shortstop, like it could be, it's like a decent award guy. Like he can, hit a little bit, maybe be an up and down guy. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, cause he's always, he's not been a great hitter, but like there's been some potential with the bat and this year. He seems to have maybe found something in his swing. I'm not sure I haven't seen him, um, mm-hmm. but I saw him a lot with Lola and I saw him last year in Greenville. Right. So yeah, he, he's, I mean, someone, another guy to go check out. I mean, he's got off to a really strong start. I think he had four hits in his first game or yeah. something. He snuck into the top 60 uh, in the Sox prospects rankings when Yeast and Coca got traded. And uh, I think he might be poised to move up a little bit, frankly. 
if it shows that, I mean, it, the organization is believing in him. I mean, even when Jeremy Rivera came back from suspension, he was splitting time at short with De La Guerra, which stunned me. I don't know about you, but. I mean, I just think they, 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 they seem to like something about him. So. They do. They do. Yeah, we'll so, see. So that's interesting. Uh, but the thing that has a lot of people up in arms about the Chavis promotion with Devers staying there is like you, the point that you kind of made of both of these guys need game reps, right? But my kind of counter to that is, A, I think Peralta's getting three weeks tops to show he's got it or he doesn't in Pawtucket. Yeah, I didn't have enough characters. I was like, he's either going to be up in the big leagues or cut within two weeks. Well, that's the thing. Is he's if not he's, sticking around AAA. If he's got it, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he's got a July 15th opt-out. Yeah, I don't know if they can do, like, give guys like that opt-outs, but yeah, I, I just sure. don't Sure, why can't you? Yeah, you definitely can. Yeah. It's just yeah, that I, you, you're, it's a term you write into the contract of, you know, you, you know, if you're not on the 40-man roster, you can activate this clause and we either need to add you to the 40-man or release you. Yeah, I just, it, it's, he was worth a shot, and in order to proper, properly evaluate him, excuse me, they need to see him play every day for the next couple of weeks. And mm-hmm. you can't, you're not going to call up Devers to DH him and play him once a week in the field. It right. just doesn't make any sense. Right. So the question then becomes oh, well, you've got two guys who need game reps, and now they're on the same team and they're not going to get game reps. To me, less important than the game reps, which are important, but let's be honest here. Raphael Devers could play third base tomorrow and not have a ball hit to him, right? Yeah, I've, I've been to games where he hasn't had a ball hit to him. <laughs> so much, much, much more important than that is the work they're doing before the game with Carlos Fables in Portland. And yes, Devers could absolutely do that in Pawtucket with Bruce Krabby. That's the reason Krabby's up there. But it, it's it's for two weeks, it's not going to hurt him. It's like It's the same thing with when Chavis was clearly – ready for a promotion in the Carolina League and everyone was up in arms of why hasn't he been promoted yet. It's because waiting two weeks isn't going to set his timetable back. Chavis yeah. is not going to make the majors this year. He's going to start next year in Portland, most likely, unless he comes into spring training and looks like a monster. I mean, you've got to figure Chavis goes to the Arizona Fall League, right? Oh, almost, I would say it's almost a guarantee. Yeah, it's almost a guarantee. And Let's assume for a second that he's still in the system next year, which is its well, own, the big if, which but. is its own thing. Maybe he starts in Pawtucket, but even if he starts in Portland, it's not going to set his timetable back. No. So it's not a problem if you give him, you know, let him take another three weeks. I mean, here's the thing: in June, in uh, in June in Salem, Chavis was on a pretty horrendous slump which it, both he and Josh Ockamy were slumping, and that's a big reason why Salem didn't win their division, because they, yeah. they were leading the division down the stretch. They were and brutal down the stretch. Collapsed. They just couldn't get it done, really, and it's it fine. Hit. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, Chavis in Salem in June in 17 games, he hit 231, yes, with five home runs, but he struck out 20 times and walked twice. Uh, he struck out in 29% of his at-bats down the – or plate appearances, sorry, down the stretch. So, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, maybe a little bit of bad Babbitt luck, but he was He's always scuffling a little this, bit. So. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of a slump. Nothing I'm worried about, but yeah. it's not like he wasn't putting up Barry Bonds numbers, you know? Like he was for a couple weeks. Like he was for a few weeks, yeah. And that's why you don't promote a guy after a two-week hot stretch. You know, same thing with Devers. Devers had his slump in Portland, and he turned it around, and it's great, and he's ready for P- P- Pawtucket now, but... Waiting a couple weeks isn't going to hurt him. So, at any rate, I don't think it's the end of the world. I think it's fine. I think it's going to be for two weeks, and everyone's going to Good for live. Portland, though. Get out to Portland while you can. Yeah, yeah. Part of me, I mean, I'm going to get to see Portland in August, and... <laughs> you won't be seeing Rafael I won't, Devers. I won't be seeing Devers, but I'm kind of happy I'll be seeing Chavis, in theory. Maybe. In theory. Yeah, potentially. Um, well, let's, let's just go ahead and say we've been dancing around it. Um, I think if the Red Sox need anything down the stretch that's going to require some kind of significant dish cost. Chavis is gone. Most likely. Cause I mean, if you're a team, you're going to ask about Devers. They're going to say no. You're going to ask, ask about groom. They're going to say no. You're going to ask about Travis. And I, I'm not sure they want to deal Travis it right depends. now. He's contributing it, to the major league team, but I think they would in theory. They would in theory, but it would, for, for, I mean, we've got an email that we're going to read in a minute that talks about, like, Josh Donaldson. If they're going to trade for Josh Donaldson, yes, you happily give up San Travis. 
if you're trading for Josh Donaldson, you're probably giving up Jason Groom. I mean, you're not going to get Josh Donaldson. You're probably giving up Raphael Devers. Yeah, you're not you're not getting Josh Donaldson without those guys. But I don't I don't think the Blue Jays would deal him in the division either. So, yeah. But um, but yeah, like I mean, it's a very like it's definitely a possibility. But I mean, there's no point in speculating until something happens. Yeah, I mean, the the reason I say that, and then I'll I'll just close the book. The point I want to make: Chavis fits the exact prototype of the type of player that Dave Dombrowski has traded since coming to the Red Sox. A, he's positionally redundant. Slash, they don't even know where he's going to play, if you want to kind of make the, com- the comparison to Yohan Moncada in that sense. Um, in that, his primary position is third base, and Devers is the future there for them. B, it's very, very possible that this is the peak of his value. Very, very, very possible. Um, we'll see what he does in Portland for the next month, but if he's mashing in Portland, you know, if he goes into the offseason and comes back next year, I mean, he's had injury issues through his entire career with the system, uh, with the Red so- in the system for the Red Sox. Um, he's got one good half. He's had a good half season this year, a good month last year, and that's about it. Uh, you know, he's the type of guy that Dombrowski has been willing to trade because he might be at the peak of his value. If, if Michael Chavis did a Javier Guerra, maybe not a Javier Guerra, maybe not that drastic, but if he never hit like this again, would you be surprised, Ian? No. If he gets to AAA and, no, you know, I mean, maybe Bryce Brents. How about Bryce Brents? Let's go with the I mean, Bryce Brents comp. We've seen we've seen guys have dominant half seasons and then just never like repeat it. Like think of like Chase Swan Chang. Bryce Brents has done Chase it before. Chase Swan Chang. You always Sorry. confuse Chase Swan Lin and Chase Swan Lin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's because Chase Swan Lin's in my mind right now because yes. of we'll the other get to that motion. in a second. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, no, I wouldn't. Yeah. So anyway, that's why I say that. Uh, yes. Moving along to the other promotions really quick. I will briefly mention Steven Nagosik, promoted from Greenville to Salem. We've talked Close. about him, Ian Closer, being used as an MLB-style relief role. And someone made a – I chuckled. I think they were just kind of being funny, but a snarky remark on, on Twitter when I said that he's being used in an MLB-style closer role when they said he only comes in in games that don't matter at the very end or something like that. Was that um, after that game a couple of days ago? When, it could have been. It could have been. Um, yeah. But, That's I mean, the, the reason I say – yeah, it's very, it was funny, but I didn't respond because I didn't know if the guy was being serious or not. But the uh, the point I'm making is that he doesn't – pitch in any kind of a rotation or you know most most minor league relievers get like two days off between appearances yeah yeah i wouldn't say most it depends on the team like i well, saw especially I lower saw, in the minors i saw colorado last year run out the same guy back-to-back nights okay like, <laughs> let me say this in the boston red sox farm system yeah let me, th- it's an important <laughs> distinction no that's fair in the boston yeah. red sox farm system it is rare for a guy to be used even with one day of rest in part because you're getting everyone their work and sometimes yeah. they're just I mean, they have, enough, they aren't have enough like, innings. They have like a set schedule every day. Yes. It's known they know who's pitching. Right. So. And and but it really looks like with Nagosik that he's being used as a true closer. Um I think he finished every game he pitched in, in I like that though. Yeah, I love it. I think it's interesting. If there's certain, I wouldn't do it for everyone, but if you have certain guys who have certain skill sets, why not, you know? get them experience in where you think they could potentially pitch one day. Yeah. And so, he's the type of guy, I mean, he's got pedigree. He closed in college for, what was it, Oregon? Yeah. Oregon, yeah. He was Oregon's closer for his senior or junior year. Mechanics and, that would never last in longer roles. Yeah. Even if, even he has out zero of the chance of starting or any being a long reliever. And just let him go out there and throw mid-90s or low to mid-90s for one inning and see what happens. So it's been interesting. I mean, he pitched on back-to-back days once recently, although granted the first day he threw one pitch and got out of the inning, so I think that's why. But, um, yeah, it's very interesting how they've used him. I look forward to seeing how they use him in Salem if they're going to continue doing that. I can't see why they wouldn't. But that's that was kind of interesting to me. So Steven Nagosik, who as of right now is our number 20 prospect in the system, he'll probably – I think he gets bumped down a little bit only because there are guys entering the system ahead of him. Yeah, because the issue is a long-term still a reliever. And yes, but it doesn't mean just, we're down on him if he falls. We, no, we've seen, though, that like relievers are very fungible and things can happen. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so Nagosik promoted. And the other promotion, Ian, which we should probably talk about for a little bit, Portland shortstop slash, we're told, utility guy. And I say that because he's barely played anything other than the shortstop this year. 
Zue Lin is a major leaguer. Uh, the Red Sox severely, <laughs> severely lacking in middle infield depth with Dustin Pedroia hurt. Rutledge got hurt the other night. He's now on the seven-day concussion DL. Um, we've, we've talked about Brock Holt and Marco Hernandez being out. Skipped past their options in Pawtucket and called up Zue Lin. Uh, Lynn is having a very good year. He right now is the number 41 prospect in the top Sox prospects rankings. Like I said, he's mostly played shortstop, but in his time in the system, he's played short, second, third, and center. Uh, in Portland this year, he's hitting 302, 379, 491, which is 120 points of slugging higher than anything he's ever done before, in large part because he has significantly retooled his swing yeah, uh, his his lowest ground ball percentage, so that's percentage of balls in play that are ground balls, entering the year was the forty seven percent ground ball rate he had in twenty thirteen. This year, he's hitting two thirds of the balls he puts in play into the air, which is very significant. That's a huge change. Apparently, he has completely retooled his swing mechanics in order to. Hit yeah, he the doesn't ball just the slap more. the ball anymore. He yeah. used to have like the thing where he'd basically be running when he made contact. He would just hit slap ground balls to the right side or left side. Mm-hmm. He's a lefty, and now he it actually stays in. And there's like his he has like more of an uphill swing path and everything. And mm-hmm. I give him credit. I mean, <laughs> I was based. I've seen him obviously a ton, and I thought he was like a solid org guy. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought the potential was there. I think we have it in his profile that he could be like a solid utility player eventually. Mm-hmm. That was like the ceiling and fact that he's in the pick leagues now i mean that makes a they invested two million dollars that makes it a good signing <laughs> which is oh, kind of the thing but well he is a quote major leaguer right now is what i would call it because is he, i thought he played yesterday well he pinch ran hey he got an appearance there you go all right. that's all i care about well and i think um, so the the reason you call him up i think let's let's be clear here the red sox aren't expecting him to do much no i would be stunned if he even starts the game yeah. Nah, I wouldn't be stunned. I shouldn't say that. I would be surprised. Well, because the thing is, you've got Devin Marrero up. Marrero is your primary third baseman right now with Sandoval. Sandoval's <clears throat> ear infection. and uh, Ear infection can be bad. Don't minimize them. <laughs> I don't minimize uh, them when they're real. Um, Dustin Pedroia is dinged up. It's just they don't have any depth. I they mean, have no depth. Well, and the thing is, water. and again, let's say this again. The reason they have no depth is that they have four middle infielders or three middle infielders on the DL and one not on the DL who probably could be. In well, and they, but they, they also traded Mauricio Dubon and Carlos Asuaje, who both would be in the role backup utility guys at the big league level if necessary right now. Sure. And, and but you had agency. Marco Hernandez. Well, no, I, I agree. But also in minor league free agency this year, though, they just, they didn't get anyone. Well, yeah, and that's the problem because what I was about to say is the options in Pawtucket were as follows. Mike Miller, who people will remember from last year coming up. Uh, Hecker Manessis, who's a minor league org guy. Uh, Jansen Witte, who... He can't play shortstop, so he's not. can't play shortstop and isn't really an option. Although, I mean, I don't think you really need a shortstop, though. The other option is Brian Court. And, well, I mean, but, well, but I was going to say, the reason you don't need a shortstop is you've got Devin Marrero. I guess so, yeah. So Witty was not option. a second baseman either. I mean, he's he's played there, but he's not he's played there, but he's not. Yes, he he lacks the fielding acumen necessary for what they needed. And Ryan Court, like you said, who's hit well, but recently hasn't been hitting all that well. And the thing is, in a bench role, I want someone who can play defense who can pinch run. The only one they like, they have no speed in the system. Yeah, which we've kind of talked about. And Zue Lin is that is like, I mean, he's not like the fastest runner, but. He's faster than anyone they have on the bench right now. 55 runner? Yeah. 60 like a, maybe? He, he doesn't steal a lot of bases because I don't know if he just isn't. This year, this year in Portland, he's 8 for 10. Yeah, I don't know. In past years, though, I think like last year was like 11 for 20 or something he or 11 for 18. 10 for 17 last year. Yeah, there you go. And so, I mean, but he can really pick it. And as we've talked about, that's why like guys like Jeremy Rivera, we have high in our ranks compared to what you'd think based on their bat is that in this day and age, the value of defense can't be understated. And positional versatility and defense. If you can do those things and have can make contact and run, you have a chance to be a big leaguer. And that's what Zoo Whalen can do. And with as you said, it's kind of taken like everyone getting hurt, but 
Hey, yeah, and the other, the other thing, too, the reason you add him and not those other guys is that all five of those options are Rule 5 eligible this offseason. The only one you're going to protect is Lynn. Yeah, I mean, Lynn would probably get taken. because he, he, he would absolutely get taken. Because he would do, I mean, there's an NL team that would use him. And mm-hmm. I like him in this role. If Like, I'm not sure if the bat's ready to even for a bench role right now. No. But, but, like, in, like, two years, in, like, a Brock yeah. Holt super utility role, not, though, in the sense that Brock Holt actually plays a lot, but more in, like, a, you know, you play him, like, once a week, twice a week, maybe. Like, mm-hmm. I could see Lynn doing that. And... I mean, he's going to hit like 240 with probably, or maybe 260 with five home runs all year, but still. I mean, yeah. that's a valuable player that saves you, you know, having to go out and sign someone if he can develop into that. Yeah, I was going to say 2019 for Lynn in the role that they have him in now would be great. <laughs> yeah, it's just not right now. <laughs> yeah, maybe second half of next year if they needed it. But, so. I mean, it, it was it was surprising, though. I, I was on the way to Lowell, and I, I looked down at my phone, and it was blowing up with people talking about Zuway Lin. I was like, what could Zuway Lin have done that was so exciting? And then <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's something. Zuway Lin, major leaguer. I think he... He's one of only a handful of Taiwanese major leaguers. Isn't he the second? No. The other one was Lin. No. No? That's not... Or maybe the no. second for the Red Sox, I think. No, he's... Yes, he's the second for the wet Red Sox. That's what it was. Yeah. The other one was Shea Swan Lin. There are... Okay, according to Baseball Almanac, there have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So I think he's the 14th... No, he's the 13th uh, major leaguer from Taiwan. Uh, The best one probably... (sighs) None of these guys have done much. Chin Hui Sao was like a closer for... Oh, Chin Ming Wong is the other one. Oh yeah, I remember him from the Yankees. He's still technically active, I guess, according to... I mean, this is probably a big deal, though, over in Taiwan, so... Yeah, and Wee Yin Chen is active right now with the O's. He's a good, pretty good pitcher. Or, no, is he still with no, the he's, he's with Miami now. He's with Miami now. That's right. That's right. Yep. All right. All right. We... So, interesting. Taiwanese baseball players. Got to love it. Uh, okay. Well, that's, I mean, I think that's it for the promotions, really. Yeah. There's yeah. more transactions, though. Uh, he, well, <laughs> there's. Uh, which ones are you referring to? Because they, they signed Doug Fister and Johnny Peralta. Uh, I don't care about those. We've mentioned Peralta. Doug Fister starting today. Makes sense. Give him a shot. Yeah, whatever. Eddie he's, Bain likes him, I guess. If he stinks, you cut him in two weeks. I mean, I think Gammon said that that Eddie Bain saw his last couple starts and recommended him. So give him a shot. Yeah, it was, I, I I made the joke. They're playing the Angels today, whose minor league system he was in at the time. And it was the I, I joked it was the old Bill Belichick sign the guy that was just on the team that you're playing this week to get the playbook move. <laughs> I thought you were. Gonna, I thought you were going to say he was their top pitching prospect, but um, <laughs> no. Well, for, gosh, he might have been in that system. <laughs> yeah. Um, what 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 uh, transactions are you referring to? Because I'm drawing a blank. That uh, they signed like every draft pick. Oh, all right. I was going to get to that later, but we can do that now, really yeah. quick. Um, yeah, we knew the Red Sox were going to sign more, at least more draftees than last year. Uh, last year they signed what fourteen. I was just about to. I was just counting that exact thing up. Let's see. Last year they signed ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, twenty-three or twenty-two. Sorry. 22? All right. Well, this year already within yeah twenty-two two weeks of the draft, the Red Sox have signed twenty-two draftees and two undrafted free agents. And that doesn't um, yeah, and they've they've signed eight of their top ten, and they reportedly have agreements with more. Yeah, the Red Sox have signed eight of their top ten draft picks. They signed first round pick Tanner Houck to exactly slot, which is fine. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I think mean, we predicted that. I think yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, you know, he drafted him twenty fourth overall. That's about where he was expected to go. Two point six million and some change. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the second round pick Cole Brannon slot for that pick was nine hundred ninety three thousand nine hundred dollars. So call it nine ninety four. Brandon got an above slot bonus of one point three million, which I think surprised us a little bit, Ian. But based on my conversation last week with Jim Callis, I'm not terribly surprised. Yeah, it seems like he was someone who was more higher regarded heading into the the spring. But and he, he had a bad year, of course. And he, he also was hurt. I don't know if that 
he talked about that, but he had like a broken hammock for the first like six weeks of the high school season. Oh, or right. That's right. We didn't so, talk about that, I don't think. But yeah. yeah, so he missed some time with injury, and but still, I mean, I think he was looked at as kind of like a borderline first round pick entering the mm-hmm. spring. So, mm-hmm. they and the Red Sox reflected that. Yeah, and when they picked him at sixty three, they knew his number. Uh, yeah. and if they weren't ready to pay that, they wouldn't have picked him. Correct. So, uh, Brandon signs for one point three mil. Uh, the third and fourth round picks, Brett Netzer out of UNC Charlotte and uh, Jake Thompson, right-handed pitcher from Oregon State, have not signed yet. Thompson just got done playing in the College World Series, uh, and I'll explain why I don't think Netzer signed yet in a minute. Uh, fifth round pick, Alex Scherf, uh, right-hander out of Texas, college high school, or sorry, high school picture uh, right-hander. So the slot for that pick was $296,500. We knew it was going to be an above slot signing. He got an above slot bonus of $700,000, which I think is a little below what we thought he would get. Yeah, I mean, I guess they obviously knew his number, and he doesn't see I guess he wasn't a college guy. That's yeah. how I would explain that number. Yeah, so he, he I know, for example, Mike Andrews, uh, and I talked about this last week with Jim. But uh, Mike Andrews, our editor-in-chief, projected about a $900,000 bonus, and that seemed right. Consider that Logan Allen got seven hundred and fifty k, and he wasn't regarded as highly as Scherf. Yeah, I would have said like eight fifty, dollars probably. nine hundred. Yeah. I wouldn't have you know, turned an eye at. But yeah, if they signed up for nine hundred, like I would have been like, fine. 700 seems like a good piece of business. Yeah, yeah. And if you look at Brandon and Scherf combined, which you probably shouldn't, but $2 million for those two, sounds right. Yeah. That sounds about right. You know, maybe you knew Sheriff was going to be a little bit under. You say, all right, well, we can do that, considering, you know, maybe give some of the overage we're not giving him that we could have to Brandon. I don't know. Maybe you can't really look at it like that. Anyway, um, sixth round pick, a guy who I almost mentioned when we were talking about Steven Nagosik, Ian, uh, Zach Schellinger, right-hander out of Seton Hall. Slot for that pick was 230, 230K, and Schellinger got a below slot. $175,000 dealt with some health issues this spring uh, was regarded by MLB.com and baseball America as a top 200 draft prospect. I like that. They got him for below slot Ian. Yeah, I'm a fan. I, I won't, I'm looking forward to seeing him as a um, college junior who had a rough year. Um, I'm kind of surprised. He didn't have a rough year. That's, I mean, he just didn't pitch. He just didn't pitch. Well, that's what I'm yeah. saying. It, yeah. He, you know, if you look at the likes of like, I mean, at the same time, even when you go back to school in that situation, I mean, granted, you know, like a Kyle Funkhauser is a little different situation where, you know, he was the 35th pick and thought he would move up into mid first round. And he got picked in like the fourth round after going back. Yeah, but, but stuff's back now. But yeah, that's why I took him in our fantasy league. But we don't uh, play fantasy baseball. I don't know no, we don't. About. Yeah, no, um, we don't at all. But is yeah, Schellinger, I, I like him a lot, and I think he's a guy they might use in that Nagosic role. Yeah, I mean, he's a high year. eight. I, he's a reliever, no doubt. And but the stuff, I, if if it's healthy is very good for what I've heard. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing him mm-hmm. though. I was a little disappointed that I guess I sent him to GCL because he, well, I think that's to rehab probably. Yeah. So if you, I mean, if you haven't pitched, I think that makes more sense to send him there. Even if it's for a couple weeks, then yeah, send guess. him to Lowell. I think, I think it's almost kind of like a rehab assignment given that he hasn't pitched at all. Um, and if he, and you know, it's, it's kind of like send him there first, right? It's kind of like, think about the Sean Anderson situation last year. You know, yes. where he, he goes he, to Lowell and clearly couldn't pitch. Yeah. Uh, send him to the GCL first. That way, if it's not going well, you're just keeping him there and not awkwardly shutting him down publicly. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the seventh round pick, Tyler Esplin, outfielder out of IMG Academy in Florida. He, uh, slot for that pick was $180,700, and he got $250,000. So kind of the inverse of the Schellinger pick. Uh, I think some people were surprised he got over slot, especially because he had apparently come out and said, I'm going to sign with whoever drafts me. But that said, he is a high school senior with some leverage. Yeah. Uh, I think mean, that's a, not surprising. Yeah. He wasn't a, a, a rated draft prospect, but the, the point it that... Whatever. It doesn't matter. A, a point that Hudson Belinsky on the Baseball America Draft podcast made the other day was that after like 150, after the first like 150 or so guys, and there's variation within there too, but after that, the rankings that are published publicly are almost meaningless. Yeah, teams teams boards look nothing like the rankings that are published. Yeah. So. so, you know, when you see a guy like, oh, he's not even rated in the, you know, BA top 500, it's like, well, neither was Mookie Betts, neither was Josh Ockamy, neither was, I mean, there's plenty of examples of guys who weren't rated who yeah. get above slot bonuses and justify them. 
And and with Esplin, you're talking seventy k. Who cares? Yeah, That's pocket not, change. Not huge, not, it's not a huge amount. Mm-hmm. And then uh, as it, these were in, I think as of when I rec- when we recorded with Jim, but uh, the eighth, ninth, and tenth round picks, college seniors, and Zach Sterry, first baseman out of Oakland, uh, Tanner Nishioka, second baseman from uh, the Pomona Pomona Pitzer team, and Jordan Wren, uh, outfielder out of Georgia Southern, all signed for five grand each. So there was a pretty significant savings for those picks. I think of about four hundred k that the Red Sox can uh, move to other picks now and that they already have, basically. So looking at the cap plus 5% number, which is what the Red Sox true cap is, because they're going to go up to that, um, there is about, there is 896 grand, to call it, remaining to sign Netzer and Thompson and to give picks after the 10th round over 125K. Slot for Netzer and Thompson doing the math in my head real quick, is 929,000, or no, 930,000, call it. So, you know, they're going to sign the two for combined below slot, but I don't think that that's going to be a problem. I think the reason they haven't signed Netzer yet, Ian, is they want to make sure that Thompson gets done, and then they'll go to Netzer and say, here's what we have remaining. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but the, those two know the numbers, too. They do. They do. But it's also, they don't want to get, I mean, it's protecting yourself, right? Yeah, they, they just can't risk anything because right. if those guys, I mean, I think they'd be kind of in trouble cap-wise if those guys don't, yeah. yeah. If the so, money doesn't work for those two. Because right now, they're they're over the 5% slot number for the picks they've signed in the top 10, I believe. Yeah. Uh, so they do need to sign at least one of them or they'll lose a pick next year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so they'll get them both signed. I'm, yeah, I'm not worried I'm not about worried. it, but I think that's Especially, the reason. And the holdup too with Thompson signed. was Thompson was playing in the College World Series. Exactly. While well, you're still playing, so exactly. exactly. And he finished. I think you said Oregon State was eliminated. So they have been eliminated. Yes. So um, Thompson became their de facto ace in the College World Series. Didn't pitch great. Um, yeah, I, I didn't watch either game. I, I saw the beginning of his first start, and he definitely looked like he was kind of pitching on tilt a little bit. Maybe not on tilt. That's not the right word, but he was definitely kind of amped up. He was overthrowing. Uh, there's some issues mechanically, and I think that that's kind of something that between Hauk, Ch- Thompson, you know, Scherf, and Selinger, they've all got plus fastballs, um, but they all don't necessarily have the prettiest mechanics. And so I think that that's something they think they could, all right, well, we can work on mechanics. Um, so, that, you know, they'll maybe clean up some things there. Hopefully that'll help him with some command and control issues that he looked like he might have had in the College World Series. So, um after the 10th round, the Red Sox have signed uh, the following players. The, in Lowell, there's third baseman Garrett Benj uh, from Oklahoma State. If you listen to the Jim Callis episode, he talked about Benj a little bit. I will direct you there. Um, Frankie Rios, shortstop out of USC. Uh, is Cutter Crawford there? Cutter Crawford's there, right? Yeah, he signed. Well, I know I, he's signed. I'm saying in, in Oh, yeah. I, let me, I, I have their roster right here. Yeah, um, I got it right here. Hang on. All right, yeah. So Cutter Crawford, right-hander out of Florida Gulf Coast, is in uh, Lowell now. He's the 16th-round pick. Rios was the 17th-round pick. Uh, as is left-handed pitcher Dominic Labruto out of Florida International. He was the 18th-round pick. Uh, the 21st-round pick was U- Lucas Young out of Mobile. He's a right-hander. He's in Lowell. Uh, the... Let's see, uh, 24th round pick, Charlie Madden, catcher out of Mercer, another guy who Jim Callis mentioned as a a senior draftee. Uh, Madden is in Lowell. I'm kind of surprised they didn't pop Madden in the 10th round, but maybe they knew it was going to take more than 5K to sign him. Uh, And then I think, let's see, uh, I think that's it for the Lowell guys, except for undrafted free agent Duran Olinger, uh, the right-hander out of Davidson, who was kind of, he was there ace their top pitcher and they upset North Carolina to win their regional and move on to super regional as a four seed. Uh, he basically, I think he, he, I, I was Googling him real quick when they signed him. He was set to go to pharmacy school at the university of Florida, but, uh, Hey, he pitched himself into a pro tr- pro contract. You do you kid. That's yeah. I like to him. see it. Good for him, man. So he gets to go be a professional baseball player for a while. So he's in Lowell as well. Uh, meanwhile, in the Gulf Coast League, uh, the Red Sox, have, Red Sox have sent their 22nd round pick, Hunter Hayworth, who's a right-hander out of Cal State Chico. Uh, Corey Behenna, a left-hander out of Wingate. He was also a college junior. He was their 25th round pick. 
Uh, 27th round pick, Xavier LeGrant, a second baseman out of Spartanburg Methodist, who uh, was committed to transfer to NC State. Uh, Spartanburg, of course, is right next door to Greenville, for those uh, wondering. Uh, so interesting signing there. Uh, third baseman, Michael Osinski out of Longwood University, who was a college junior as well. He was the 31st round pick. Uh, the 32nd round pick and 33rd round pick were right-hander Taylor Ahern out of Cal, Cal State San Marcos and Tanner Rayburn, a left-hander out of Grambling State. They're both in the Gulf Coast League. 35th round pick it was first baseman out of Northern Kentucky, Trey Gans. He's there. And uh, the 36th round pick, Rio Gomez, left-hander out of Arizona, who is Pedro Gomez's son, for those who watch ESPN and uh, never know who Pedro Gomez is. Uh, Rio Gomez is in the Gulf Coast League, as is undrafted free agent Jacora Arnold, who was a high schooler out of Georgia, uh, third baseman. Interesting to, to see an undrafted free agent high schooler, which is a thing. It's just not very common. I, I can't remember the last time the Red Sox had one. Nick Moore. Was Nick Moore? I believe so. An undrafted Back in, free agent? That, 2013, maybe? No, oh, Nick Moore was older than 2013. 2013, actually, they had one, too, in Jervansky Johnson. That was oh, the other. right. Well, he was uh, committed to go to college to play football. That's a little different. Yeah, I'm trying to think. What year well, last year, I mean, so last year they, they signed Ivan Huelamon out of uh, Puerto Rico, but Puerto Rico's a little different, frankly. Um, I, I don't quite consider it the same way, but looking quickly, I mean, usually your undrafted free agents are, you know, college seniors. Um, oh, I lied. Nick Moore was drafted. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, no, uh, Javansky Johnson was the last one. Yeah, Javansky Johnson in 2013. Roberto Reyes in 2010. Oh, yeah, I remember him. Catcher from Boston. But then he didn't play uh, catcher. So yeah, he did. He, he wound up playing outfield. But no, he played catcher for a little bit. Roberto Reyes, yeah. did he? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that guy's someone else. Well, at any rate, so, yeah. So they signed a lot of draft picks. They signed a lot of guys, and they're going mean, to they sign needed, more. They needed to, though, because they just didn't have any players. Well, let's let's get into the next thing, then, Ian, because we already kind of analyzed the top picks. You've been to Lowell. You saw Jay Groom. We'll get to him in a minute. but I did. Uh, let's just start with, for the sake of transitioning, we'll get to Groom. What else is there that's interesting? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not a lot. It's... Not a great team right now. Um, no, they they need the, they need the signees. I mean, they're going to get Tanner Houck soon. They're going to get Jake Thompson when he signs, presumably. I the, the lineup is it's one of the poorer lineups I think I've seen in my time covering Lowell. Um, there's just there's not a lot. I mean, uh, like Juan Barrientos hitting cleanup. He has power, but. Eight, I don't think he can hit, so that's not really going to matter. Um, I mean, Yohan Ibar's there. Ibar, Ibar's the only. Ibar is by far the most interesting bat still, and maybe him and Stanley Espinal. Ibar, it's tough because he's repeating the level. He still has zero approach. Like he's got eight strikeouts, no walks in his first. Well, he's repeating the bat. level after getting demoted from Greenville. Yeah, broke camp with. But he just. I don't know. He still is someone you can kind of dream on, and he's actually squaring balls up to right field, which is something he never did last year. He's hit like three is three triples already, um, and he's just he's making harder contact than I've seen him in the past. But he still, it's just a lot of swing and miss. So I don't know. It, he's it's tough on him. He's uh, he's in his fourth year, and oh, sorry, yeah, fourth full season in the system. Yeah, I Nick mean, Hamilton can run. Um, he's left fielder, but eighty he, eighty runner, true eighty. He got, I got four one two yesterday, mm-hmm. so that's that's eighty because four one from a righty is eighty, I think. I could I can Google it. I have it right here. Um, good radio right here. Yeah, hey. I should I should know this. It's just it's early in the morning. I know. Not really. It's not I'm not tired. early, but okay, yeah. So um, where is it? Here we yeah, go. four it's four one seventy because because three nine yeah. from the left side. It's a, he's like a set. He's like a seventy runner. I'd say. Okay. Um, well, underway but, he might be an eighty, but out of yeah, the box yeah. it's a seventy. But out of the box, yeah, four one to seventy. Um, but and then Espinal, yeah, uh, I'm kind of third he's baseman. A, Stanley he's a weird Espinal, one. not to yeah. be confused with Santiago Espinal, to whom he is not related, but uh, no, signed out of the Dominican Republic in 2015. I know, I know some scouts okay who kind of like him, but he just. I don't know. He doesn't really do it for me. He's he's bigger than list. He's put on a ton of weight. He's probably like 
six two, six three, like two ten right now. I would mm. say two hundred maybe. Um, and but I just I'm not I don't I'm not in love with the swing. Um, it's got this kind of like he starts uh, square with his hands kind of low and has this little hitch in it. That I don't really like. And in the field, he doesn't have great range, and uh, he's the full, made a couple errors in games I've seen. The footwork doesn't look great. Mm-hmm. Got good off though. But he's still young. He's all, I mean, he just turned 20. Or actually, he's 20. And I guess he signed late. But I don't know. He, he's kind of interesting. Because they had him hitting third, too, which seems to indicate that they, they saw something with him. Mm-hmm. Um, in the in, Of the pitchers, I saw Jor- Jorvin Pantoja. It's kind of interesting. He was a lefty. He's 19. Um, he was up to like 92. With I want to say, well, you're going to hear me flipping. Yeah, well, he's 19, signed out of Venezuela in 2014. Had really good first season in the Dominican Summer League uh, at age 17, and last year was pretty good in the Gulf Coast League. Yeah, he's like 88, 90, some projections, like a decent frame. He's listed 5'11", 175. There's no chance he's 5'11", 175. He's probably like 6'2", mm-hmm. um, 6'1", 6'2". Um, let's see. Juan Barrientos is actually funny because he's really, or oh, not Juan Barrientos, Juan Florentino. He's a little reliever. He's probably like 5'9, five, 5'10, five, but he was up to 96 yesterday. Huh. Which is a lot, which is, I mean, for from his size, is pretty impressive. Uh, and he was interesting because he was the DSL closer last year. Yeah. So, 13 they, they saves. Talk, and I've seen him both times I've seen him pitch this year. Actually, he's finished the game too. So, uh, and he has some feel for breaking ball too. So I kind of like him. Mm-hmm. Um, let's see. I well, saw, let's just I, get, let's just, all right. Well, no, there's one more. I was going to say, uh, the, the, the other guy who's actually kind of interesting who was rehabbing was, um, why can't I find his name? Oh, Harrison Cooney. Yeah. Uh, Cause he's up in Greenville now. He was a rule five pick out of triple a from the angels and he got hit around a little bit, but he was up to 97, which is pretty, with a plus a flash of like a 55, 60 slider. So that was pretty interesting. He, he didn't have any idea where it was going, and the delivery's rough. But I, and what was noteworthy was uh, he was up to 94 prior to his injury. So the v so found jumped. Three miles per hour. Yeah. So he's someone who I'm going to keep an eye on. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is Mr. Jay Groom. Who's so you've seen it. both of his rehab starts. I have. The first one was uh, he only went, what, two and a third innings, I want to say, because then it just – the skies opened and it was pouring and they right. canceled the game. And right. then uh, he threw last night and he only actually went four and two-thirds innings. I think the goal was probably to get him to like five innings maybe, but close enough. And, yeah, I, I mean, he has – he he's, he's looked pretty good, but he's had some – it's fallen apart a little bit later, like – in the first start, he uh, he was he came out firing bullets. He was like ninety two to ninety one and ninety three, um, topped out at ninety four. Just was keeping the ball down, uh, just missing bats. He got his curveball. Just the hitters had no idea what they were doing against his curveball, um, which is not surprising. I mean, we know how the curveball is, and the changeup. Eh. I'm still lukewarm on it. He threw one good one, but the, he threw a couple others that were just straight and didn't really have a lot of movement. Was it better or worse than the changeup we saw in spring training? Because um, in spring training, it was okay. It was about the same. I mean, okay. he threw one good. He threw one good one, one like averageish one, but the rest were like 30s, 35s. Okay. So it's a work in progress for him for sure. Um, and then in and so the first start went pretty well, and he was actually cruising. But then he then obviously the rain kind of put a damper on that. No right. pun intended. And so the, then, the yes, damp, oh, rain, eh, mm, eh. And kind of eh. forced. Yeah. Um, yesterday, so he ended up, I don't know if you have the lineup from yesterday. I think it was like four and two thirds innings. You know, he went three and two thirds. Yes. Sorry, not four and two thirds. Um, he went three and two thirds, gave up four hits, one earned run. Oh, they did change one of the hits to an error. That's what I figured. Um, and two walks, five strikeouts. And the stuff was a little down compared to the first start. So where in the first start, he was like 91, 93 when he came out, top 94. This start, he was mostly like 89, 88 to 91. Um, and then late in the game in the fourth inning, he finally hit 94 once. But the stuff, I mean, he just wasn't, he didn't, he didn't look crisp. Uh, the fastball, and especially in the fourth inning, his control was off a little bit. 
And he had the curveball going again. No surprise there. The changeup, he didn't throw it a lot, but um, he got one swing and miss. He actually threw one good one for a swing and a miss, but other than that, still, it's just I don't think he has a great feel for it. And it's something that they're going to have to force him to throw, I would say. And he just, it was just, I, I don't know. It was weird. It, it he, he really, his defense really let him down. And well, you were saying before we that, started recording, there was one play in which they made three errors and it looked like a Little League game. Yeah, no, it was bad. I mean, don't they, describe I mean, it, but. Lowell had six hits yesterday and they had five errors. And there should have been another error that they didn't give an error on. But he did give up some loud contact, um, and not in that inning, actually. Funnily enough, that inning, he was just getting, like, it was Texas leaguers. Like, loop to right field, loop to center field, one hard hit, loop to left field. It was just kind of unlucky. But at the same time, it was, he just, well, he wasn't crisp. He wasn't hitting spots. He wasn't missing bats that he should have. I don't know if that makes sense. But there was just, like, it was situations where the, there was a strikeout was beckoning and he was just missing a spot. And so they were able to put contact on the ball. And that's, I mean, that's, you know, good hitting by the Connecticut team. And I just, I'm not sure. I think he needs another start down there. I'm not sure they're going to promote him to Greenville yet. And long term, I don't really have any concerns. I mean, I still think every, like the tools are still there, but I just think this is going to be a slow developmental path. I don't think he's going to be, he's not going to be a fast mover, you know? Right. He's someone who I think is going to be like a level a year. So like, and if I wouldn't even be stunned if he starts at Greenville again next year at this point, like Mm -hmm. I just, I think it's going to take him time to develop. I That's guess, awesome. yeah. I guess they could to start the year, kind of like, you know, almost like, like almost like Travis Lakin's going back to Salem this year for a month. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's it's too early to talk about that, but I just I think there are things he needs to work on, like the the changeup really needs development. His consistency with his fastball is something that I mean, it's been a kind of a big talking point. His velocity, and maybe we should just get to that too. Like, yeah, well, the, the, like, let's do that because you here you want to go, you can talk. Yeah, well, just because the, the, the reports we heard last year coming out of the draft were that he, you know, touched 97. Uh, he sat mid-90s and touched 97 with the fastball, and he, you've seen, we were just talking about this before we started recording, you've seen four starts. I've seen four of his seven professional starts. And, and you saw him at Instructs, and you saw, we saw, we both saw him in spring training, and he's never top 94? I've, yeah, I've never seen him higher than 94. I, I actually wrote it down. So I saw his first start in Lowell last year. He was 89 to 91. Um, in the later innings, he came out in 91, 93. Second start, he was 89 to 92, touch 93. Third, or that was instructs. Um, this year, first start, he was 91, 93, touch 94. And then the most recent start, he was like 89, 88, 91, touch 94. So I've never seen him higher than 94, and he's mostly been the, like 90 to 92. Mm-hmm. And I guess that some people are disappointed with that. I don't know. I, well, I, let's go. I, I let's go it. here, Ian. I, I, my question to you: We currently have him graded out as the system's number two prospect, with a projection of a role six player, with a floor of a three and the ceiling of a seven. So, just to put you know to kind of put that in perspective for folks who may not be as familiar with the scouting scale, we've got a floor of an organizational high minors contributor, basically the type of guy that gets the triple A and doesn't really play, pitch in the majors or double A. We've got a, a ceiling of a seven, which is a number one or a number two starter, uh, a regular all-star. So not an ace. An eight is an ace. An eight is a Kershaw. Um, seven, probably call him more of a two, right? Just to, for what people yeah. are thinking of. It's and like Lester. It's pretty, like he can John be the, Lester he can, is the comparison that we he have. He can be like a number one in a rotation, but he's more like, yeah, he's like a solid. You like, like it better if he's a two. two. Yeah. A, a roll six is a quality number two and number three starter. The, what we have there is a John Lackey. Uh, I don't love that comparison, but sure. At the time we, we wrote it, it was a little fresher and made more sense. Now that he's kind of fallen off from that, I don't love it. But call it like, I don't know, what would you call a, a roll six right now if, if if you don't like the Lackey comp? Like a... Rick Porcello? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Actually, well, he's Porce- been terrible this year, I though. I know. Somewhere um, between 2016 Porcello and 2017 like Quintana's Porcello. is like a two, three. Jose Quintana, yeah, I could give you Jose Quintana as a six, sure. I don't know. It, it doesn't really matter. That, 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 like, the. But anyway, player. that's the description. Is quality number two or number three starter. Guy who's in your rotation is not going to fall out of the rotation. Yeah. Maybe what Drew I, Pomerantz is pitched like, just to really annoy people. So what was the question then? So the question is, that's what we have him graded out as. Based on what you have now seen in four starts, do you still agree with that grading out of him? 
I mean, okay, this is the thing. He's not – there's like a huge gap between what he is right now and what he could be. Like long term, do I think he could be like a rule six pitcher? Yeah, absolutely. But – it's going to take him. Like is that the projection years. you would put on him right now? You work for an MLB team, and your job relies I, on the fact no, that I'd, you need to I'd do write this. him as like a three or a four. So you'd, you'd you'd call him like a five and a half, maybe like a fifty-five. Like a fifty-five, yeah. Okay. I, I I just I have questions about the changeup, and I think the fastball. I think there's more velocity. I I think that I think he's pacing himself. That was my theory last night because. He has, like, at one point, there was, like, guys in second and third, and he just decided, he's like, all right, I'm going to throw 94 now. So, and he did. And, it, you know, it was kind of like, uh, who did I see do that earlier this year? Oh, was it? Lakens? Oh, Hector, no, Hector Velasquez did it. Hector oh, okay. Velasquez was, like, 89-91, and then all of a sudden, the base is loaded, and no outs, and he's hitting 93-94. And there are just certain pitchers where, like, he can, I think Groom could pitch at, like, 90-92 and has, and has better control. And that's why he pitches at that. But if he needs to, he could like reach back and touch like 94, maybe 95. I haven't seen the 95, but I think it could be in there. And I do think eventually he'll settle into like a 91, 93, maybe 92, 94, which from the left side is fine. Like, I think, I don't know if you can bring this up, but like left handed starters, there aren't many who throw that hard. Like, even Lester right now is not even throwing hard. So, yeah, no, that was, I know, I remember reading about this last year where the, like, although Madison, the velo scale, had to kind of get retooled. It got skewed this year, but like Madison. Well, not Bumgarner, not even this year. We're talking like last year. Even like Madison Bumgarner, though, sits like ninety two. I want to say or like ninety one. So it's not like lefties are like you know buzzing like mid nineties consistently starters. And the curveball is legit. It's like a sixty five seventy curveball. But I just long term, he's got things he needs to work on. And you know, right now, given how far away he is from the big leagues and the strides he needs to take, both with his command. With his changeup, and obviously, I mean, we've talked about it, but it's a high maintenance body. He's going to have to watch it. Like there are definite concerns, and you know, he's not—he's polished for a high school kid, but we need to remember he's a high school kid at the same time. You know, I think the expectations kind of got out of hand a little bit for him, mm -hmm. given his pedigree, and people kind of need to pump the brakes a little bit and remember that Groom is still just 18 years old. Yeah, I mean, if if you're looking at velocity, so in the scale that I'm looking at from the BA Prospect Handbook. Uh, they have an average fastball is 91-92 from a starter. I would assume that's a right-handed starter, so you'd go 90-91 for a lefty. Uh, so 92 to 94 would probably be like a 60 fastball from a lefty, or 60-65. Yeah. yeah. But I was thinking, I don't know if you can bring up like major league pitchers velocity. Like, I'd be interested in seeing like what is like Quintana throwing this year. What is like Dallas? I mean, Kuiper we'll throw? maybe we'll do that in the future. I'm not bringing. Yeah, it. that's that'd make for even worse radio than we typically give people. And that's the last thing we want is to make this podcast even worse than it already is, Ian. Yeah, sorry, I'm having a cough and fit over here. But um, <laughs> so I, I think though that people need to. I think the expectations need to be tampered a little bit with Groom. And but at the same time, the upside is still there. I mean, you don't see high school kids who look like him and have the no. field. Yes. I mean, he's got a body, and that helps. Uh, that that can he's handle got, a starter's he's workload. Got, he's got the physical uh, projection, not projection. He's got the the physicality and like the size you like in a starter. He's got his delivery is one of the most clean, like best deliveries I've seen in a high school guy. I can't remember anyone who even low comes effort. Close to it. Yeah, there's just it's low effort. He repeats it well. Arm slot can get a little out of sync on occasion, but it's not nothing major that everyone that happens to everyone. And he repeats it well. He can it's something he can hold in the games. And it's just but at the same time, it's as I said, the change up, you know, consistency. It's it's all stuff that it's not surprising for an eighteen year old. And I think if you look at him without knowing his pedigree, you'd be very excited. But if you know the pedigree, it can kind of jade you a little bit when you come in. And pe I think that's the problem we're running into is people know his pedigree. And then when they hear, you know, because I, I, yesterday I was tweeting about, I mentioned, you know, he was sitting like 80, 89 or 88 to 90. And I got a bunch of tweets that were like basically saying he's like a scrub because he's not throwing hard. And pitching isn't just about velocity. Like you need to be able to locate. And if he can locate at 90 to 92, I'd rather do that than go out there and try to throw 92, 94 and have no idea where it's going. Right. Right. Um, all right. Well, that's, that's, let's, let's end it there on groom. Um, we promised people Pawtucket in uh, really quick, yeah. just cause we got to get out of here. There's nothing on Pawtucket. I mean, uh, Jamie Callahan looked good. Ty Butchery looked good. 
they have some relievers. The starters aren't great. Henry Owens, I have no idea what's going on with him, but there's big problems there. Um, there's nothing in the lineup. So, yeah. <laughs> that's well, that's, that's why you go and have to sign Johnny Peralta and, and Doug Fister. Yeah. I mean, Swihart, I, I, he, I don't know what's up with him. He can't hit right now. Yeah, I mean, I got, I got asked about Swihart the other day on the Baseball Prospectus Boston podcast, and I didn't really know what to tell him, frankly. But uh, he looks lost. I mean, his at-bats... He's just not good at bats. Is it triple A no. haze? I mean, is it? I think I, I I was talking about this with someone in the game recently, and I think he needs to change his scenery. I just think it's 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 got to be tough when you know, given everything that happened last year with starting, it takes a toll. You know, you're you're in the big mm-hmm. leagues, you get anointed the starting catcher, you get demoted after two weeks, then they tell you actually you're not even going to play catcher anymore. You're playing a different position, and then you get hurt, and he just he's just he's pressing a little bit, and yeah. It's, it's concerning. It's rare that I will. I mean, I don't think I think of my I don't think of myself as a homer. I think of myself as a a optimist, an optimist, a positive person. So it's rare that I'll take the team to task for how they've handled a given situation. But I think they they've screwed the pooch on on the Blake Blake Swihart situation. I think yes. last year they mismanaged that situation so horribly. That uh, yeah, I think you're right, and you know when I was on the the BP Boston podcast, uh, Jake Devereaux, the host, mentioned Swihart as a guy whether they might consider trading him. And I know last year they probably wouldn't have, but I think we're at the point now where I think Swihart and Shavis are your top two trade chips right now. I mean, he's and he's still a value around the game, so yeah, sure, I would agree. And versus like Henry Owens on the complete opposite, I don't think Henry Owens <laughs> no. has any trade value at all none, because none. He just. I don't know what is what's going on. Like he's up to sixty walks and sixty nine innings this year. His last start, the one I saw, he was actually he was. I thought he was going to get run after like two innings. He, I think he had like four walks in his first two innings. He just had no idea where he was going. Couldn't find his release point. And he actually ended up retiring like fourteen out of the next fifteen hitters. But still, it just didn't look crisp. And then yesterday, I think yeah, he walked eight guys in four innings. And that was his yeah. second eight walk outing in the last three. And it's just, I, I just, I, I don't know what to, what there's left. It's to interesting say with because him. you you read about, you know, like Kevin Bowles talking about him, and it's you know the the, the changes at this point are coming from him. You know, they basically yeah, he's said that his, he's tweaking his mechanics, and when you start tweaking mechanics at AAA, that's a problem. I mean, it's the same thing that happened to Garen Chikini. Yeah. On the other side of the plate, I mean, you know, because the people are going to say, oh, it's the Red Sox not developing pitchers again. It's like, well, no, player develop. Then this is what I'm talking about, where I'm optimist, and and it's. You know, just kind of looking at it from a perspective where it's not that you have to assign blame, it's that developing a major league player is hard. Yeah, and the jump, he's someone who, he got that taste of that big league level at 2015, and, I mean, he wasn't great with Boston. I think he was fine. He wasn't bad. No, he would have been a serviceable five. But it's just, he just, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's just he's regressed, and the command profile is just non-existent. To the point where I, I don't, I wouldn't expect him to contribute at any point. To yeah. the big well, or see we'll see. Future, unless something changes. Yeah, I mean, maybe he finds it. Who knows? Yeah, but right so, now. I mean, but he's, he's like kind of. He, he's he, was, big, huh? he was like I was saying, where he's like the opposite of a player that Dombrowski trades because you'd be trading him at the. You wouldn't get anything. The you know what's the opposite of a peak the. Valley, Val, uh, yeah, low the point. lowest va- low point of his value. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we've got one reader listener email, Ian. Let's get to that, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, our email today comes from Tyler, and Tyler asks: Does the aggressive promotion of Brian Mata this year, the good international haul expected in July, the development of Michael Chavis, and first and second round picks this June make you fear the big Dave gutting? I think he means the system at this trade deadline. At first, I thought they didn't have the firepower to get a guy like Josh Donaldson anymore, minus De- minus Devers and Groom being included. Uh, not sure if that will be the case soon. Uh, thanks for the email, Tyler. I he, okay. I, I get like his I, point. I oh. get his point. The system will look much stronger in two weeks. I was going to say like three days. Well, <laughs> oh, no, it's well, no I mean we're yeah. a week and a half. The system is going to look a lot better in a week and a half. Then, let's put it this way: 
the Sox prospects rankings that we could put up after the signing deadline on July 15th are going to look a lot better than what they look like right now. Because yeah. you're going to have Tanner. So how probably enters the, enters the Hauk's a top six prospect. I think we at least all agree on that yep. in the system. Um, you've got Brannon and Scherf are going to be top 20. Yes. Probably. Yeah. Trust, trust me. Once you start doing it, I haven't are. done it yet. So yeah, they are. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, b- both Mike and I have them in our top twenties. Daniel Flores is a top ten prospect. Daniel probably. Flores, the catcher out of Venezuela, is probably a top Ooh, ten. Hopefully, prospect. we'll talk about with someone. Yeah, we're we're working yes. on that. We're working on that. Um, who else? Oh, uh, who was the other guy? I was just thinking of. I mean, so the Red Sox are also signing a couple of shortstops. Oh, Brian Mata also is going. Brian Mata is going to move up. Mata is going to move moving into the top ten. I mean, this is the thing, though. When you trade as many people as Dabrowski has, you need to start building depth. And they're going, they're making positive steps towards that this year between the draft and the international mm-hmm. signing. But I think this person does make a good point is that what is going to happen now? Is Dabrowski going to see that depth and be like, ooh, okay, we need like a reliever. Let's trade four more guys for one. Or we need a third baseman like Mike Boustakis. Let's trade Michael Chavis, Brian Mata, and something else for him. Or are they going to be like, eh, let's kind of go bargain basement hunting and go find the next, you know, Trevor Plouffe or whoever gets DFA next and, or Johnny Peralta and try them out and kind of keep the farm on the road. It's on. And I, I think that's a valid question. Well, let's look at, I mean, so say like Jed Lowry, if you're going to go get Jed Lowry, I, you, I don't think you need to give up Devers, Groomer, Travis. Do you need to give up Shavis or, or Swihart? Probably Lowry? not. You I would think? Swihart maybe like Swihart and Schwarren. Would Lowry's, you do that? Lowry's having a good year, man. Isn't he free agent after the year though? I believe so. Would you give up like Blake Swihart, and Mike Schwarren for Jed Lauer? Uh, I think that's probably something like around what it would take. Probably. I mean, I would rather try Devers first, man. You're saying try him at third, not trade him, right? At third, yeah, yeah, yeah of course, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just wanted. To- I don't think no Devers is Devers is untouchable. I don't think. Yeah, that's everything from what I understand from extensive conversations is yeah, there's, there's almost 0% chance he gets traded. Right. So. Right. I mean, I, I, they, yeah, he's in the plans. They're not moving him, And I think that's why they're being so deliberate. Frankly, that's why they're taking their time with him because he's in the plans for the future and they're not going to rush him just to rush him. Um, it was different last year when Yoan Moncada came up because it was the end of the minor league season. And it's not like he was getting, he was losing at bats somewhere else. Yeah. Might as well call him up. Um, but I, I think that it, it's – in terms of – obviously the goal is to win at the major league level. And if you think that you can acquire the piece that puts you over the top, then you have to do it. But at the same time, in order to build a sustainable team and to not have to do things like trade you know, four guys for a reliever like Carson Smith or whatever – or not Carson Smith, um, Tyler Thornburg. Thing, to not have to make deals like that, you do need to develop homegrown players. Like the reason the Brewers have a Tyler Thornburg, Tyler Thorn, Thornburg, is because they develop them. Same with the Mariners with Carson Smith. Like you develop guys like that, then you don't have to trade for them. And mm-hmm. so it's kind of like a catch twenty two. It's like, how do you balance the need to win now with the need to develop your homegrown players so you don't have to go out and trade for those guys in the future? Sure. And I think that's kind of where the Red Sox get caught up. Is that, you know. In the past, they've obviously, under Ben Sherrington, it was more. They'd look to develop their own guys. But now Dabrowski, as we know, his MO is he likes to go. If he sees someone he wants, he's going to go out and get them. Mm-hmm. And it's it's kind of, it's been a big organizational philosophy change. And I still think they're trying to figure out how to, like, balance the two, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the only spot, really, where I can see them out paying a lot at the trade deadline would be third base uh, if, yeah. if it just continues to be a black hole and they have reason to believe Devers isn't the guy. Not that I would agree with them, but uh, yeah. I can't see them going and spending a lot of money on another setup guy. Or not no, money, I mean, spending a lot of I think of they value. have to. I mean, because look, Thor- Thornburg's out for the year. Carson Smith is out for the year, I think, also, most likely. Well, no, he's but, close to – did he have another setback? Yeah, he had a setback. Oh, God. I want to say I that I read that he they don't know or they might not know how to proceed. I think was the where was it? Okay, because he was close to a yeah. rehab a rehab assignment. He okay, had some so soreness that, and they pulled the he- him back. The headline is Red Sox haven't closed the book on reliever contributing the season after latest setback. So that's generally not a good sign okay. when it's like we're not sure he's 
not. But I mean, do you just do you do you go and get another reliever, and this time again at the trade deadline when the price is going to be inflated? And everyone well, no, no, needs I'm, relievers. I'm saying you don't. I would rather yeah. they give the internal options a shot. Right. I, I mean, start... Barnes has pitched well. I think you, if you don't like the guys you have up, then you start turning to the Callahans and Well, that's what, that's what I mean. I would start cycling through. I would give Austin Maddox a week. If he doesn't work out, go to Jamie Callahan. If that doesn't work out, go to Chandler Shepard. If that doesn't work out, go to Ty Butcher. I would start cycling through guys and just see what mm-hmm. you have. Yep. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. So, um, yeah, third base, though, it, that's... That's the issue, because they don't yeah. have anyone at AAA for third base. What they have right now is not sustainable. You can't play Devin Barrero for an extended period of time at third base. He right. cannot hit enough to do it. Like The glove is fine, but you can't carry someone hitting 170 or 160 especially, with a yeah. 200 OBP, especially when they're getting no production out of their catcher either. Mm-hmm. So you can't have two black holes in your lineup in the American League. It just doesn't work. Right. So. Oh, I mean, and then it's not like Hanley. I mean, Hanley Ramirez is dinged up. Mitch Moreland's battering a battling a toe issue. Yeah, I mean, I they mean, they have to make a move for depth. And as you said, it's the question is, do they go for that lower tier guy who does who's not going to cost much, or do they like the, even someone who maybe is DFA, or do they go for more of the bigger, slashier guy like a Mike Mustakis, Jed Lowry type, who's you know obviously in the last year of their deal, but you're going to have competition for guys like that, and that's going to drive the price up. Yeah, looking at uh, fan graphs, you're looking at Jed Lowry, Eduardo Nunez from the Giants. I wouldn't mind that one. Again, he's a rental. Uh, Todd Frazier from the White Sox. You're looking at Mike Moustakis, obviously, from the Royals. Uh, And you're looking at, I think that might be it. Oh, Yang Vera Salarte from San Diego. He's on the DL right now. Is he? Yeah. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Brandon Phillips is a second baseman. Yeah, that's it. So, oh, David Fries from the Pirates. I mean, it, that's that's one where if there's if you can buy low, maybe. But yeah, I mean, with those guys, I mean, to get the likes of a Lowry or a Frazier or a you know Eduardo Nunez, you're probably looking at trading a Swihart or a Chavis. I think. I would imagine, yeah, uh, probably with with the likes of a Shawaran or a Sean Anderson. So I don't know. That's a lot. But that said, if you've got a black hole in the lineup and you're going for it, that you're going to have to do something. I, I just don't know whether those options are better than what Devers can give you. I mean, we'll see. It's going to be interesting. This is definitely something we'll probably, I'm sure, talk a lot more about over the next month. As we once we get past like July two, it's kind we of will. trade season. So we will. yeah, we will. we will. All right. Well, with uh, with all due credit to David Shoemaker, we got to get out of here. And so, uh, we do. thank you for hopping on. Yeah, you literally have to get out of here. So, thank you everybody for downloading. We will uh, have a. We're going to be releasing something around the holiday next week, uh, whether it's the third or the fourth uh, or the day after. Uh, I need to get in touch with our potential guest uh, when he gets back from the Dominican Republic. And hopefully, we'll get him on. Uh, it's a past guest. And we'll leave it at that. So uh, we'll have some talk about July 2 and the Red Sox Hall there. Looks like they're going to be back in a big way. Uh, So we'll talk to our guest about that. And uh, maybe I think we might hold off on the rankings talk, Ian, until – well, we'll see how much time that interview takes up. We might hold off until after our mid-July re-rank. But, of course, it might depend on (laughs) – who knows? If all the draftees are signed before July 2, we might just hold off until then rankings update on the fifth we'll figure it out yeah all right well at any rate everyone thank you for listening for ian i'm chris and we'll be back in your eardrum soon thanks everybody